It's time to focus on seniors with Helping Seniors TV. The television show designed to make you aware of senior issues and needs, as well as to acquaint you with the resources available to help you age in place and with dignity. Now, here's your host, Joe Steckler. I'm Joe Steckler, and welcome to Helping Seniors, the television arm of Helping Seniors of Brevard County. Our show is designed to provide you with information on how to develop your own aging and care plans. Our topic today is hospice care. Joining me is Kathleen Laporte, Senior General Manager of VITAS Hospice. Hi, good afternoon. We're here today, viewer, to talk about hospice care and helping you understand a lot more by the time the end of this show than they know is when we started, Kathleen. And mm -hmm. that's our mission today is to help our viewers to understand what hospice care is. And having said that, how about talking a little bit about VITAS Hospice or VITAS Health Healthcare of Melbourne, as well as your national organization. And that's where you differ a little bit from other hospice organizations. Right, we are um, one of the first and leading hospice providers in the United States. VITAS began in 1978. Um, we have a rich history of bringing compassionate care quality care to, at the end of life, to more than 1 million patients um, since our inception. Um, we have more than 11,000 employees across the country, and we take care of more than 14,000 patients a day. Um, many of our employees, we have longevity in our organization, have been with the company more than 25 years. So we have a strong leadership that has um, a lot of experience in the hospice movement. I think what I was interested and, in was the fact that you told me, I asked Kathleen, I said, how many employees do you have here in Brevard County? Right. And she answered me with 300. I do, we employ 300 people in Brevard County. We came to Brevard County in 2002 um, at, because there was a demonstrated need for hospice care in this county. And we care for more than 600 patients a day now. Um, we have a main office in Melbourne, we have a satellite office in Barefoot Bay, and a satellite office in Titusville. We also have an inpatient unit on Merritt Island, so we geographically are designed that we can certainly quickly meet the re needs of residents at the end of life. Well, okay, now when you say inpatient unit, mm -hmm. is that similar to what the other hospices have when they call their hospice house? It is, we, although we do that a little differently. We partner with one of our community organizations, and that's where we have our inpatient unit. Who do you partner with? We Our inpatient unit is at Courtney Springs. Um, we've redesigned a unit, and we have 14 beds at that. 14? Mm -hmm, at that's that facility, a, which we keep very full. Then that's the largest in the county. It is. No, um, I think Health First is 16 beds. Okay, but you're mm -hmm. darn close to being the we largest. We are darn close to being one of the largest, yes. And you know, I probably know more about VITAS Hospice than I do the other hospices, but I've talked to them more than I have VITAS over the years. I don't know why, mm -hmm. I, do, I really don't, because I know so many of your people. And for years, uh, one of your workers, Susan Blakesley, has is, is been a friend. Mm -hmm. And I've known Susan and her work with VITAS for many, many years. Right. But I also know that uh, hospice is, is an extremely necessary and needed Mm -hmm. element in our community. And so what is hospice? What is it? Yeah, most people don't really know very much about hospice. Again, we've been a leader in this industry since 78. We recognize this as a really important part of the healthcare continuum. Um, we're an end of life option of care for people. Um, so that what that means is if anybody that has a life limiting illness of six months or less, they um, can become a hospice patient if their physician deems that appropriate. Um, we're more like a philosophy of care, although we do have, um, we provide that care wherever the patient may choose to be. So um, our focus is not so much curative, because we know that we're beyond that, but our focus is comfort measures. So we want to do you raise comfort a good point care. Though. You mm -hmm. raise a good point though, between curative care and, uh... Mm -hmm. and palliative. 
Palliative care. Mm-hmm. How do you pronounce it? Palliative or palliative? Pa- palliative care. Palliative yes. care. Mm-hmm. But one of the questions I did want to ask you, and I might be to right now, how do, how do the doctors determine mm-hmm. at what point the primary care doctor no longer treats for aggressive care and the hospice doctor says it's more palliative care or mm-hmm. Not curative. One of the things that we do a little differently than maybe other hospices is we work very closely with the patient's primary physician. So if the patient's primary physician wants to be involved in hospice care, once he determines that, you know, we've done everything that we can possibly do and hospice care is appropriate, that physician knows that patient probably better than anyone else. So he can stay involved in hospice care with the support of our physicians as well. He stays involved? Yes, he can stay involved. But would he stay involved with the idea of curative care? No, he understands that our patients are receiving palliative care um, and he works with us. So we send him information about how his patient is doing. If he wants to continue to order for his patient, he's more than welcome to do that. Probably most physicians at that point, though, want to turn it over to our physicians who are experts in hospice and palliative care. So they usually do turn them that care over to our physicians. And when you say experts, the term expert, folks, I learned a lot in a recent care of a hospice patient. Um, hospice has access to pain control methods that I don't think are generally used by many doctors. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have you have a way of being able to to bring stronger medications in. You, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Well, our physicians are board certified in hospice care, so they are the experts in end of life care. So. Some illnesses, patients have a lot of pain, and and they do require different medications than you would have out in the community. So our physicians are experts in managing that. So um, that's usually not been an issue for them. It's not what? It's not been an issue for them to obtain it. Most regular physicians are really a little uncomfortable with those medications. They're not not as comfortable as the hospice doctors? No. No. At a certain point, Kathleen, we have to recognize that the comfort of the patient overcomes Mm -hmm. the comfort level of the family, Mm -hmm. if you want to say it that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's hard for the family. It is hard for the family, and that's why we're we're designed as an interdisciplinary team. Not only do we have a physician and nurse managing the physical symptoms of a patient, but we have a chaplain, a social worker, we have volunteers that are really going to help the family deal with that. Many times once we get the symptoms controlled for the patient, we're dealing with all of those issues that the family is dealing with in losing someone they love. Yeah. You mentioned uh, six months or less for a doctor to recommend uh, hospice care. Uh, there are situations where hospice is in longer than six months. Though. It is because that's not an exact science. Um, right. I, you know, one of the things that Medicare has done differently is they recognize that, you know, we're, everybody at the end of life, you know, comes to us with many different diseases. They can be a cancer patient, a, you know, they can have heart disease, they can have lung disease and stage liver, you know, they can have ALS, they can have MS, you know, so there's many different diseases, but everybody has symptoms as they're towards the end of life. So hospice can really benefit that through this interdisciplinary team working together. The social worker focusing on those psychosocial issues and those emotional issues, the chaplain focusing on those spiritual issues, the volunteers providing comfort. And in fact, April is 11th through the 18th is Volunteer Appreciation Week for all volunteers. So if you know of somebody that's volunteering or or somebody that wants to volunteer, they certainly could contact us. But um, you should recognize those volunteers for the good work that they so do. So you're always looking for volunteers? We are. It's particularly in the very north end of the county, in the Titusville area, and the very south end of the county. And they can reach out by calling our office, 321-751-6671, or they can go online and look at www.vitas.com and 
put the keyword volunteers in there. And, they will... and your phone number is also going to be on the show. So that okay. people, people can read that phone number and they can call you and get it. They could. Yes, yes, yes they can. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even as I've watched people die, mm -hmm. I've watched hospice volunteers, hospice team members in there, I see, I've often seen an element where the hospice worker is able to make the patient more relaxed, mm -hmm. uh, maybe sort of put them at ease so mm -hmm. that there isn't a constant stress about the thought of dying. Right. That's, that takes a special team, a special person, a special approach to do that, Kathleen, and I don't know how you develop that. Well, we focus on quality of life. You know, we all know what the outcome is going to be, but we want to focus on giving the patient and the family the most normalcy yes. that they can have and the best quality of life. So, and one of the benefits of being in hospice is that our workers have more time to spend with patients and families. We're seeing the same patients over and over again, so we develop a relationship. You know, for most people, in my experience, I've been doing hospice since 1986, they, it's the fear of the unknown. So the more you can educate, the more support um, you can give the family, the more you can let them know what to expect, the better off you are. We also have a lot of other support systems built in. So for instance, we have um, availability of staff 24 hours a day, seven days a week through telecare. If there are symptoms that are out of control, we know that most people want to die at home surrounded by their loved ones. So we can put in something called continuous care to support the patient and family. Or if a patient can't be managed at home, they can go to our inpatient unit. So we have lots of different support systems that we can utilize to reassure the family as well. One of the questions that uh, was our tossed back and forth over the email system was, um, the importance of uh, beginning the planning process mm -hmm. early on. Right. Can you uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Right. Less than 30% of Americans have really done any advanced planning for end-of-life care. You know, most people say that if something happens to me, I will, I'll let my family make that decision for me. Well, in most instances they've not even had that conversation with their family. So the family really doesn't know what their wishes are. So the best way to begin that process is to have those conversations with your loved ones. What would you want at the end of life? There's important um, documents that you should really look to fill out. So you should fill out, um, designate somebody to be your health care power of attorney or healthcare proxy, sometimes they call it. Somebody who, if you're not able to make those decisions for yourself, you would trust with ma making decisions for you um, regarding medical treatments. The other thing that you should do is complete a living will. A living will will tell your family exactly what it is that you want to have done for you. So it is important to have that, and most people don't have those discussions. The National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization and many other organizations are really trying to encourage people to have those conversations because if you wait and you make those, convers make those decisions when you're under stress or duress, you may not make the right make decision right. for your you're family. Right. So, And you may want to make a decision where you have been judged mentally incapable of making that decision mm -hmm. and it could cost your family dearly in terms of financial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's just, well, why do you think people choose Vitas Hospice? Well, I think that we've been here now since 2002. Um, we've grown significantly. Um, we care for 600 patients on a daily basis. But we really try to meet pe people where they are. And um, we have grown through word of mouth because our focus is doing what's right for patients and families and providing that support and comfort that the patients and families need. So knowing where the family is in that continuum is where we meet them. You know, we, everybody's not going to know exactly what they want to do at the end of life. Our job is to speak with them about goals of care and provide right. that support for them. You know, this is like a tutorial on, on hospice care. And, you know, 
people will see this show probably first on uh, Bright House Television. And if or and if you tell somebody that you want to see the show, they can go to the Brevard Alzheimer's Foundation or Helping Seniors of Brevard dot org, and they can pull this show up at any time, any place in the United States or any place in the world, and see Kathleen Laporte talking about Vitas Healthcare. Mm -hmm. That's what's so important. Information is power. It is. And if if we keep secret what you do with hospice care. It's just like one of the questions I had here. I said, what are some of the other types of special care that VTOS provides? Mm -hmm. Do you do more than hospice care? Um, we are hospice care, but within hospice, we do do some specialty things. So, for instance, we have a music therapist, and our music therapist can work with patients that are confused and disoriented. Sometimes you'll have a patient that's confused, and the music therapist will come in and play a song that they're familiar with. They may be agitated, and that will calm them down. We do do pet therapy. We have what's called our Paw Pals program. So we do we can bring in pets and, you know, just the nature of petting a dog or a cat or holding an animal will really um, make a patient more comfortable. I've heard we, of the pet therapy, but I've never heard of music therapy. Mm -hmm. Yes, we also have a respiratory therapist for our patients with COPD. You know, for patients with COPD, it is frightening when you can't catch your breath and having a respiratory therapist yeah. that can go in and educate our patients and families is really a great benefit. So we're really proud to have those additional therapies. What can a what can a respiratory therapist do? How can they increase a person's ability to breathe? They can teach them how to do their breathing treatments. They can teach them how to manage their, you know, along with the nurse, how to manage their medications. They can reassure them. Um, so it's that education and that support that will help that patient to become more comfortable. I never thought about that. Are you talking about using like the tube, the thing that you blow? Yes. In? The nebulizer is helps open up the lungs for breathing. You know, that thing helps more than most people want to. Yeah, they do. Most does. of us pay lip service to that. And mm -hmm. when you come out, of, I've had it handed to me several times after surgery, and I said, well, not again. Mm -hmm. But it does. It does help. It does help. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other things that uh, VTOS might do that somebody else might do? Well, Are you special in any other way? I think that one of the things that we do better than most programs is that we have our program of continuous care. We have our own staff that we've trained that does one-on-one. -on -one. So when symptoms are out of control, we try to keep the patient where they want to be at home. And we can put one-on-one -on -one nursing right there in the home setting to manage those symptoms while they're out of control. Um, so we do that quite well. I think our inpatient care is excellent. We do that as well. I think that's something that we do really well as, uh, as an organization um, to be able to manage those symptoms and prevent somebody from having to go back and forth to the hospital and have unnecessary treatments is really an advantage. Yeah. You know, one of the biggest uh, <laughs> obstacles that I have personally observed in uh, my last job as commanding officer of the Navy Retirement Home War in Gulfport, Mississippi, and then and working with various organizations here in Brevard County. One of the biggest uh, uh, roadblocks comes in uh, determining when the primary care doctor and the hospice care doctor are going to let go and assume. Mm -hmm. Well, again, as we talked about, it's really when that patient, ha when they've exhausted all curative measures, they're really going to focus more on hospice care, and we're going to focus on goals of care. Many people say, oh, I don't want to give up, and I don't want to not do anything. Well, hospice is doing something. It's focusing on quality of life. It's focused on comfort measures. It's making sure patient's symptoms are managed so that they can enjoy the time that they have with their loved ones. So that's really important. Yeah, you know, most of us think about hospice makes it easier for a patient to die. And they think that our to pass uh, without pain. Mm -hmm. And that is true. But the families go through agony and pure hell sometimes and watching a loved one die and the way they die. Um, what does VTOS do? 
after a person dies, what kind of programs do you have? Do you have grief support groups? Do you uh, make visits? I I had a chaplain when on my I was the exec of a submarine tender, and our chaplain, our submarine force chaplain, went to be the one of the burying chaplains at at mm -hmm. uh, Arlington. Mm -hmm. Every person that that man buried, mm -hmm. that their family lived within a two hundred mile radius of Arlington, he made a personal call on them. Right. What do you all do? We do similar in that, you know, as I explained, when a patient is on service, they're assigned a chaplain as part of their interdisciplinary team and a social worker. Um, they then follow that family after the patient has passed away on our program. At VTAS, we attend every death. So we have staff there to support the family when the patient dies. And then we will call them and make and offer our bereavement services and we'll determine what it is that the family needs. We do offer support groups throughout the county that are open not only to VTAS patients, but to anyone in the community that needs bereavement support. And we follow our patients and families for up to our patients' families for up to 13 months after That's a patient good. passes away on our program. Our chaplains can do funeral services, just like you mentioned. Um, so they do um, sometimes perform the funeral services for do patients. Do you have all faiths represented? We do. You know, we are chaplains, and we do have all faiths represented. Okay. Mm -hmm. a, a question that always comes up uh, with regard to, to, to hospice care is uh, use of medications, cost, mm -hmm. And how long can hospice be involved? Mm -hmm. Well, um, one of the things that people don't realize is that as part of the healthcare continuum, that hospice is covered under Medicare, Medicaid, all insurances do pay for hospice care, and managed care pays for hospice care. And under the hospice Medicare benefit, anything related to the reason the patient's on hospice or why what's related to their terminal prognosis is covered under that Medicare Medicaid benefit. So that's medications, equipment, supplies, all of our nursing visits, our different levels of care are all covered. So there's really no cost to the families. Um, so it is covered under that benefit. But how does, if a person is less than 65, mm -hmm. how, how is, under what element does that get covered? That gets covered under their insurance. Most insurances do have a hospice component or some people have community Medicaid as well. So and, that's, and, and, and we care for patients regardless of their ability to pay. So we do provide that as well. How do you, I know that VITAS has a foundation. Mm -hmm. Does your foundation help with those kind of costs? No, our foundation is really a special needs foundation, but um, we just provide that care um, either, you know, as charity care, we provide that care for patients and families because it's the right thing to do. Our foundation is more for things, special needs things. So, for instance, if there's a family member that lives out of state and can't afford to come visit their loved one, we might buy them an airline ticket. Or if the Florida power and light bill is too high because they've had oxygen, we might pay for the um, through our foundation. We call it community connections. We would pay for that um, um, Florida Power and Light Bill, those type of things. If their phone's being shut off, we may pay for that. That's what yeah. our community connections is for. You always learn something. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I knew that there were many things that hospice did, but that's one thing. I, that's one thing I didn't. I didn't know. Um, what education program does hospice have to prepare families and educate families? Well, we do a lot of education in the community as well as with patients and families. Um, we do um, education in underserved areas. So we have what's called our access initiative. So we focus on specialty groups sometimes that are typically underserved, like African-American, Hispanic, um, veterans. We focus on those people that are underserved so that we can provide care to them as well. So we do education out in the community. We partner with different organizations in the community to make sure those um, needs are met for patients and families. In fact, we were one of the first sponsors under our veterans program of Honor Flight 
here in Brevard the County. Flight? Yes, we were one of the first sponsors. And in fact, we do attend every flight and we provide breakfast for those people that are going on the flight. So we do that type of education. Right now, we're performing a series of education throughout the county for community residents. It's called Ask the Doctor, where the doctor will be available. And if they want to ask them any questions, they can ask them any questions related to end of life care. And we are doing some disease specific topics. Um, throughout the community as well for healthcare professionals. You know that they just extended the honor flight benefit to the Korean War veterans. Yes, yes, I do know that. The day before yesterday, I got my call asking if I wanted to go to mm -hmm. Washington on it's the honor incredible. flight. incredible. It is one of the most moving things that I've done uh, listen, with hospice. Mm -hmm. we, my wife and I, we're almost out of time. I want to tell this real quick. We were in a Washington, National, at Washington National Airport and uh, we saw it. 200 flights come in. Mm -hmm. It is a moving experience to watch those World War II veterans get off. Most of them are being pushed. And uh, I told the guy who wanted to take me, I said, I probably need a wheelchair to get mm -hmm. up there. But, you know, we're talking about death here, death mm -hmm. and dying, but there's also a live side to it. And, it is. And, and mm -hmm. hospice. There's it's, so many things, Kathleen. We really help people. That is our goal, is to help people to be comfortable, to support their families so they have a good quality of life. If you need information about hospice, feel free to give us a call. Thank you. And I, 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 I truly thank you for coming and being mm -hmm. on the show today because I hope, viewer, that you have learned something like I have by listening to Kathleen talk today.